The SD Ruby podcast is brought to you by New Relic. Raphael, people know me as Rafa, uh, and today I'm going to talk about um, loading the proper JavaScript for a specific page, and um, uh, well, what does that mean? Um, that means because of Rails comes with the asset pipeline, and sometimes you load all your JavaScripts all at once, and You'll, you'll try to run a JavaScript from one page and another page. That's pretty much a very simple problem that I see a lot of people that are starting with Rails 3.1 have and decided to put this short talk together. Uh, just a brief disclaimer, uh, most of the ideas and code that you see are not mine. Uh, I just use them and I found them online. So uh, it might sound that I did all of this because I just like it, but it's not mine. I'll show more who did it later. Um, you can find me in those ways. Uh, and yeah, I use mostly email. I don't like Twitter very much, but people insist to talk to me. No so, <laughs> uh, so let's say you, you start a new app in Rails. What you do, you just go and you start Rails new like you do, and then you do some scaffold, and then you generate another scaffold. And then what that's going to give you, um, it's going to give you two JavaScript files, and you're going to think, cool, um, now I can just put my <coughs> JavaScript that's specific for the product page on this product.js file, and it's going to be good. Do you know? No. Nope. Check test. <laughs> you know, that doesn't work. What's going to happen is that once you actually try to load uh, your other page, the client.js page, your JavaScript for the product page, you end up loading it. I mean, one of the features that I really like about Rails is that you can kind of start someone that's fresh off the boat of uh, using Ruby, and they still can actually do some stuff, you know? And I think that's one of the stuff that end up being the first problem if you're using JavaScript. So I, I didn't like that very much. Uh, and then that doesn't scale at all. And trying to find solutions, I stumble on, on this, uh, this way of doing things. So this is what I do. Um, on, my, on every uh, JavaScript file that I have, I end up um, calling this cool project, I'll uh, say, global variable. Uh, it kind of looks like a constant, but in JavaScript, it will be actually be a, a global variable. Um, and then I start inside this global variable, um, a product variable inside of it. And then that way, I can uh, create my own stuff that's related to that product page. Um, and then, as you see in the init over there, I'll just drop on my JavaScript code there. Um, and so. Then on my application, I'm going to put this data control, and I'm going to explain how it works later. But basically, that's how I'm going to detect uh, which page I am. Uh, actually, I'm doing first by control. Okay, so let's say you just once uh, you have a controller like I'm saying product, and you have new added and um, update and everything, and um, you just want to load, you want to load some feature that's on all those pages, all those, let's call it seven pages of CRUD, or five. So you put on this init function, and that alert will show in all the, page, all the, in all the pages that are on the controller product. So pretty straightforward. Um, and then what I would actually do to load that code that I put there, because this code by itself will never get executed. All I'm creating uh, is a function that it's going to be loaded into this variable. Think like a, almost like a, a hash. So I'm creating a hash cool project that has a hash product inside of it, that has a ha uh, hash, uh, there's a function in it that's sitting there and never get executed. So then for me to execute it, um, I'll create this file that I name it usually init. 
Um, so, and I put it on the acid pipeline and let the acid pipeline swallow all those files all together. Um, and then this init file have a cool project, which is basically a blank hash. So this will get executed before the other part, just because um, that's I usually put it on uh, before on the application JS. So then I also create this. YouTube, uh, basically what it's doing, that's the code that's going to load that, that structure that we saw on the last page. Um, and then all the way down at the bottom, on the last line, that's when I call it. So I'm calling this init function that's going to call this guy. Um, and then I'm going to go on the document body over here, and I'm going to get that attribute that was set up on the data controller. Um, so if you remember, we set up the data controller over there with the controller name. So then, um, now I know which controller I am, right? So then I call u2.exact controller. And what that's going to do is going to call the top function over there. Um, then it's going to load that hash that we created per page and it's going to find the appropriate hash to execute and then it's going to call the init on it. So basically that piece of code will execute the init function and then that alert will pop up. If I'm on the, not on the product page, I'm in the client page, um, of course the other part won't get loaded. So that's the basic idea of it and then um, the, then you can pack the whole JavaScript together. So then you can deliver that single JavaScript to your client that can be minified, and then you can push it to the CDN and it's going to be super fast and it's going to load fast and mobile. So there's a ton of advantages of doing that way. Um, the only disadvantage that I see is that if you actually have a huge amount of JavaScript, it might be troublesome to load all that hash memory first, and then then you have bigger problems. So, um, so then, if I actually want something that's going to be loaded per action, so I want to have a controller-wide set of JavaScripts, and then I want to have uh, a JavaScript for the new page or in this case a JavaScript for the index page and a JavaScript for the edit page. Then you just expand on that hash, so then you still keep the init, and the init's going to be executed on every single one, and those other two will be executed on both uh, actions. If maybe if you had an update function, an no, update wouldn't have a page, but let's say if you had a new, uh, new page, a new action, uh, the init would get executed, but no other. Uh, and then the similar what you do with the data controller, you call the data action. And then you put the action in there. And those two methods, they are um, active controller methods or active view, and they're there for you. So you can just use those. Um, and that's similar to that code. And the only difference now is that um, I'm on the bottom over there, I'm calling actually exact with an action. And then I do an extra step to look if I have an action or not. And then uh, I do an extra step to check if the type of the action is actually um, just the init or if I don't have anything. So uh, and then this is just some crazy break line that I put to make sure it fits on the screen. It doesn't work on JavaScript, so you got to backspace. Um, so that's how. It's very, very simple. Um, so I didn't create this. Uh, who created this was this um, two guys. I think Paul started with the idea, and then Jason took it and um, expanded it. And that's the link. I'll put the presentation up, and I'll give the, to the SDRuby guys. And then later on, this guy found that this is just known as DOM-based routing, and it's a pretty simple idea. But it works rock solid. I, I use it at work, and I use it in my personal products, and it works pretty good. Uh, we don't have like humongous amount of JavaScripts. We have just an OK size, but so we haven't had problems with it. Um, 
yeah, so um, I think, oh yeah, so that's cool, now that works with JavaScript, so what if, what if you want to load some CSS that's specific, you're going to encounter the same problem, you know, and uh, there have two ways to go, you can just load a style sheet that for each page, as you normally do with Rails 3, but if you're using 3.1, you might as well want to bring that out together under one CSS file. Uh, what we do is that, uh, and that's a Ben idea, Ben gave me this idea and we use it. We add the class and then we put the controller name. You can also put the action name. And then on the project CSS file, we just uh, use SCSS and wrap everything with the project uh, class. And then that will isolate everything per page and also works very good. Um, so thanks, Ben. And so, very simple idea, very basic. I can go back to code if you guys want. And if you guys have any questions, go ahead and ask. And I have a, I want to make this in a little jam. I don't know if people use it or not, if it's useful. So I would like to hear that from you guys too. I have more questions. Um, So the question was, uh, why did they choose to introduce the asset pipeline and add that extra level of comp complexity? Um, and yeah, I agree. It's it's a big complexity that they added. Uh, I believe the main reason behind it is that a lot of sites, as they grow, um, they start to have a huge amount of JavaScript and CSS, and doing all those requests to get this file end up being those files end up being troublesome. So then you not only having the number of requests per page will be bigger, you're also raising the amount of requests that you have on your server at all. So that, that was probably the biggest motivation. And um, for the small developer, that's not really that big of a deal. Uh, I would say probably not even for the medium-sized developer. But for the big guys, it ended up being a big problem. And yeah, and I like Rails, I use it every day, there's great things, but there's one thing on the Rails that bugs me, is that it feels like some people want some feature and they just put it there, you know, because it's convenient. So I thought this could even come with Rails, but it should probably come turned off as default, because that would raise the bar lower for people to start adopting Rails. But on the other hand, if they did that, people would adopt as fast as they adopted and feel compelled to you know, use it. So it's a trade off. You later. Uh, I have a question. When you say it works for a medium amount of JavaScript, are we talking about tens of lines, hundreds of lines, thousands of lines? Uh, I mean, it, thousands of lines, it, it packs jQuery with it. By, <laughs> by that, it already comes with jQuery, and jQuery is thousands of lines by itself. So it, I'm talking like, if 90% of your code is on JavaScript, then you might want to think about a better strategy. You know, if you're doing Rails with some JavaScript to add some functionalities, you're fine. But if you're using like some backbone and extensive amount of client side JavaScript, then you probably want to separate those concerns. Ben. So it's more of a kind of a suggestion, I guess, but I've use techniques similar to that for both CSS and JavaScript. And one of the issues that I've run into um, has to do with the fact that when you're kind of segmenting your app by these you know, namespaces, like projects and orders and so on, it doesn't always correspond necessarily one-to-one -one with the controller. So for example, if you're, you know, if you have styles in JavaScript related to ordering, and you've got an orders controller and an order items controller, and you're like adding an order item and then you're rendering the orders view from there, like it'll show up in the markup as being orders item in that data controller. So one thing that I've done to kind of 
counteract that is basically have a sort of output in the markup um, default to the controller name, but you can always override it if you want to. So if you want to have kind of an orders namespace, um, but you want the orders item controller to reflect that, you can set instance variable or something along those lines. And I'm kind of curious if you've run into that issue too and how you've dealt with it. Yeah, I, so Ben was explaining that he ran into an issue um, having to overload some part of the JavaScript and overload that name that's been loaded to be able to reuse some more of the JavaScript. And what we did to go around this problem is that if we, we put this into a separate file that's our functions and we load those functions from those isolated sites on the JavaScript. From the CSS, what we do, we, we, have, a, we have some kind of like a helper kind of looking CSS that's an SCSS and loads a bunch of mixings and things that we can reuse it here and there. You end up having a little bit more of end, uh, end results SCSS, but you, you, you end up having that feature. Uh, yeah, so, so like in my example, you would, have, you would keep the orders item, order items in the markup, but then just have a file that basically called the orders. Okay. So is that what you're saying? You're kind yeah, of... we, we, we would make all the CSS, maybe we even have a uh, SSS that's markup or you know specific to what it is. Yeah. And then all that that does is to load a bunch of mixins. Mm -hmm. It actually doesn't output anything. And then on the product SSS, we would load those inside, you know, inside what the product is there, we would just load those again. Yeah. So the compiled code would be a little bit bigger, but it works. So we don't have that much of that going on, so it's not a big deal. But if, yeah, you probably could gain a little bit more that way. Yeah. Um, so this is the first time I've heard about this type of solution. It's pretty cool. Um, have you thought about instead of doing it based on a controller or an action, based on maybe like routes, so that the uh, you know the JavaScript doesn't actually know which controller it's coming from? Because that might solve the problem that Ben was thinking about. If, if it's namespaced by orders, then the JavaScript looks at that, just parses the URL, and loads what it needs. And conversely, you'd have the opposite problem too. Is that you know, if, if you want that one JavaScript, um, but now you have two controllers. Yeah, the, the problem with doing with routes is that the routes kind of sit on top of the abstraction of controllers and everything, right? And when you look at the file structure the way it comes, it doesn't really support the LL that way. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it would make sense, but we just kind of ran with the Rails gave us. We, to be honest, this came as a problem. We coded everything, and then one day we discovered that all the JavaScript was running out in every single page. Do you know? I mean, it was just that bad. And we, did, we didn't have that much JavaScript, so it wasn't that big of a deal because it was the beginning of the project. But um, yeah, so that's how we actually found out the problem. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, as a developer, I also would you know, map a controller to a specific JavaScript file, and routes doesn't really play well into that. <laughs> That yeah. mapping, so that's cool. Yeah. I mean, in you, you still can load any JavaScript that you want, you know, you just gotta mm -hmm. go around that, you know. It, this is just a convenient way. It doesn't mean that you gotta use this for everything. We still write a ton of J jQuery uh, plugins and things that are completely outside of this to run our code. And then lately, what we did is that we extracted all the pieces of logic code that actually do any meaningful logic and we put those as almost like a plain JavaScript files that we can test those and we do automated testing. That's another talk. Any more questions? Can you come back and talk on that next time? <laughs> yeah, it's it's not good yet. So <laughs> maybe a couple months. Uh, I implemented something similar, but I used this gem called uh, GON, G-O-N, but basically it uh, allows you to share data between, you know, like within your controllers and then within JavaScript, so it sets up a global object, uh, GON object or whatever, in Rails, and it's the exact same thing in JavaScript, so you can say, you know, GON dot 
style sheet equals foo, and then if you do if you do the exact same thing in JavaScript, you'll get foo. So that uh, I use that as opposed to setting up um, you know the data attributes on the body. Um, I use that um, I use that method because then I could set things in the action or in the before filter or whatever, and then uh, within the JavaScript, I would just read out the, the style sheets and the JavaScripts that come from that object and just load those. So. Pretty similar to what you did, but that gem might help you uh, simplify yeah. some of the stuff. I use GON for other thing, other things. It's real cool. Uh, yeah, it's G O N is not really GON, yeah. but it's really cool. And the problem, some of my coworkers saw that in gem files, like, oh, someone put a misspell in there, and I put it in. <laughs> it's like, no, it's committed. It's, I'm not that stupid, but <laughs> um, but I use that gem, and I'll take a look at it. Uh, I'm going to chat with you about it. That might be a cool approach. I have one more question. In, in at least in my sites, uh, if you look at the um, uh, analytics or the new Relic stuff, there's a lot of time spent on DOM processing and page rendering. Mm -hmm. it, does this help with that? Do you uh, you that? No. I mean, probably not. <laughs> okay. uh, I mean, if you don't, this will probably take the same time to load, I would say, unless you are, you're sharing the same problem that I had, that your JavaScript is just loading functions and executing stuff. Right. But I think the DOM will get loaded at the same time. The problem, it might be because if you have a bunch of um, dollar signs and jQuery stuff going on, you might be processing all those selectors every time, and then it becomes real heavy. And when you don't find something on the page, it's actually the worst case scenario for jQuery, right? right. So it might be that you have that problem. You look into it, but uh, but most likely using too much jQuery for, to me at first glance. Who else had a question? Cool. All right, guys. Um,